Oh, thank you very much, Arthur. Um, my name is Tim Buistre. I'm the uh, director of the Department for International Trade in Sofia, in Bulgaria. And it's great to be back here again at Minex. In fact, uh, the last event was in Sofia in 2019, and I think I recognize some familiar faces from, from that time. Um, this session, as Arthur says, is exploring mineral resource potential in the Western Balkans, particularly with a, from the perspective of critical raw materials. And we have a very interesting lineup, program of speakers from across the region. Uh, to start, though, before going into that detail, we, I'd like to invite Sir Richard Sheriff from Sigma 7 uh, to speak about building resilience to geopolitical risk. And um, uh, if we have time, we'll take questions as we go along, otherwise at the end. So thank you. Over to you, Sir Richard. Thank you very much. Please put the microphone. Thanks. Is that okay? Can you hear me? Yes. All clear. Getting thumbs up from the back. Must be all right. Um, Richard Sheriff's my name. I'm um, a couple of points by way of introduction. I'm billed here as the executive vice chairman of Sigma, Sigma 7, which is true, but I'm also co founder and managing partner of Strategia Worldwide, which is a, a global risk advisory firm uh, set up uh, six years ago with my business partner, Ian Picard, who is going to be talking to you uh, about Tailings Protect, one of our products, tomorrow. We were recently acquired by Sigma 7, hence I'm now executive vice chairman of that. This is a, another, a, a new American uh, global risk advisory firm. Um, I'm also billed to talk about geopolitical risks in the program, but as you can see, what I've added to that is and other, because I think it's very important to understand that we have to look at risks in the round. Can I have the first slide, please? So this is my agenda. What does corporate resilience mean? Let's start with that. Think about the emerging risk we need to be aware of. And then questions I suggest you should ask yourself to ensure your business is resilient. Now this is applicable not only in mining, but pretty well sector-wide as well. And what can you do to build resilience? Uh, next slide, please. Corporate resilience. The ability to bounce back, take the shock of the unexpected, and above all, to bounce back stronger. If we look broadly at risks, what emerging risks do we need to be aware of? Next slide, please. Well, I think the first one, which has been brought home more graphically than I think we could possibly have imagined, although many of us did forecast it, is the reality of geopolitical risk exemplified by the war in Ukraine. The world changed on the 24th of February, fundamentally. Of course, it comes hard on the heel, heels of the pandemic. Uh, and we're having to deal with the tail, the, you know, the tail shocks of that as well. That has not gone away. But the reality of the war in Ukraine is not just about the conflict itself, which is grim enough uh, and, and, and hardly needs emphasizing. But the implications broadly for uh, globally are massive, whether it's uh, truncated supply chains. We live now in a world not so much of just in time, but just in case the need to build resilience. Uh, economic shocks, inflation, uh, potential recession. These are all going to have a massive impact on, on, on all businesses, not just in mining. Ally that with climate change. ESG, of course, has not gone away, and we heard very, very graphically this morning uh, about the imperative of ESG right across the West Western Balkans. Any cyber threat or any security threat, invariably, cyber remains at the heart of it. And of course, people, uh, and across, across uh, uh, Europe, particularly in my country, people and the availability of people, the talent shortage and the supply of people is, is a major risk. So we are faced with the return of the politics of, of blood and iron in Europe. We're faced with massive regulatory requirements, issues of board liability, reputation, uh, a hardening insurance market, costs of capital, supply chain fragility, and talent shortages. Some of the emerging risks. What does this mean for business, particularly the impact of geopolitical risk? Next slide, please. I think you've got to ask yourself a number of questions, and it starts with understanding the risks you face 
And not only that, but related to it, it's understanding the relationships between risks. You cannot afford to look at risk in silos. I mean, the obvious example in the mining world, it's not just about technical or geopolitical risk. It's about understanding the impact on the communities that you're operating amongst, the regional governments, the local governments, and of course, the national governments, uh, whose, whose uh, agreement, whose license you, are, you, are, you, you depend upon. Uh, in a sense, you have to seek the permission uh, of the people you're operating amongst in the broadest sense, as well as a wider range of stakeholders, international organizations, mining NGOs, and the like. Because if you alienate the people you're operating amongst, you're, going to, uh, you're gifting the advantage to your potential adversaries and to anybody who is wanting to interfere with, stop, slow down your business. And in terms of understanding the relationships between risks, it's about that comprehensive risk assessment, which allows you to look right across the framework of risks. Think of it as a spectrum, perhaps starting with commercial, economic, financial, security, social, technological, environmental, ethical, reputational, legal, political, uh, and the like, community. Uh, and, 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 and you have to tease out go through that, those specific risks and then tease out the so what's in terms of the relationships because it's so often the risk, the, the, the interrelated risks that catch the board out when you're least expecting it. And then it's about linking risk and strategy. Let me just actually on the last one, let's let me give you an example. We did some work for a gold miner in Cote d'Ivoire, miles away from where we are now. They had done a comprehensive risk assessment, or at least they thought they had. We came, we did a risk assessment with them, worked, on those comp worked through that framework of risks, at the end of which the CEO said, that was a revelation, he said. The top 80% of the risks that, you have, that have emerged from this risk assessment, this risk workshop that, that, that you've been doing with us, none of them had we considered. We'd looked at the risks, all our risks were commercial, but you've, you've helped us to tease out some of the real showstoppers in, for, in terms of commercial risk. Getting under the skin of risk like that allows a company to really think through the next phase, which is how to link risk and strategy. Uh, and this is about designing a strategy to think to, ma to manage risk properly. Nobody can foretell the future, but what you can do is think strategically understand where you're going, work out thinking right to left from where you want to be, your desired set of circumstances, working back through the, the key issues, the key objectives that need to be unlocked to achieve your strategy, the pathways or the lines of operation which allow you to get there and the decisive conditions on that pathway. And then it's about testing those strategies, testing your plans. Uh, and herein lies the, the importance of stress testing. Again, it's not so much the planning that matters or the plan that matters, it's the process of planning. Because in that process of planning, you develop an intuitive understanding of the external factors at work which allow you to adjust as circumstances change as they invariably will. And I commend to you the practice of what we call business gaming. I would in my old world, and I have to, for the sake of transparency, I was a soldier for 37 years, I'd call it war gaming. No military commander would launch an operation of he or she at the time without subjecting the plan to a process of war gaming. And this means setting up a red team to role play your enemy, your adversaries. And in the mining context, it's everybody, every, any organization who can undermine your plan and destroy it. Uh, and you get them to, and you need, I mean, the way we do it, you need an umpire organization to think it through, to develop scenarios, having done the initial risk assessment. You then establish a red team of external experts on specific areas, role-playing stakeholders, regulators, governments. You also bring in a few disruptors, shall I say, from within the company. Perhaps some young, some of the millennials in the company who think they know exactly how the company should be run and have some good ideas. But that requires the confidence of the leadership to do that. And then you go through a plan or a strategy in, in, a, in a formal way uh, uh, with a blue team, representing the company that's being tested or whose plan is being tested, the red team uh, testing, uh, probing, 
challenging. If you do this, we're going to do this. And then the blue team has to think it through again. At the end of that, you've got a whole list of areas where your plan may not be weak, may, may not be as strong as you thought it was. But you've also thought through in, a, in an interactive uh, and very creative way, and in almost an intellectually liberating way, a whole range of ways which you can address, which will allow you to address particular challenges. The key thing about this process is that it's in a safe to fail environment. It doesn't matter if you get it wrong, because you know that by getting it wrong in training, which is effectively what it is in practice, when the time comes, you'll probably get it right, or your chances of getting it right are that much greater. And then tied to that, and again, stress testing, we've worked with the mining, I mean, I can think of a large Australian mining client that we worked with, very heavily exposed in a particular geopolitical region of the world, uh, caught between a range of major national state actors, trade wars and the like. And they asked us to talk, to challenge them in terms of demand and supply. What happens if the demand for their particular product dries up as a result of a range of different scenarios? What happens if the supply dries up for another range of different scenarios? And the executive committee was able to think it through and came away with ways and ideas to, re to establish and to re reinforce their strategic resilience. And then finally, and I'm conscious of time here, is crisis management. I can guarantee that all of you in the mining world will have had at some stage one of those heart-stopping moments, the crisis happens. It could be the worst case, I don't know, a, a tailings dam collapse, as happened to Brumadinho uh, or San, San Paulo, at, 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 and at Sao Paulo in Brazil. Absolutely the worst case, of course. But it might not be as bad as that. But there will, I guarantee, be moments in your working life when you think, Ignorant. What do I do now? That's the moment you need your crisis management policies and plans thought through, at hand, easily understood, well practiced and available. And that requires time and effort. You can't just prepare a plan, leave it on the shelf to gather dust. It needs to be practiced on a regular basis, so that when the shock comes, you are able to withstand it and able to take the necessary action. Now, all of this, of course, takes time, and time means money. But I would submit to you that it is better to spend a little bit of money and a little bit of time on testing your resilience, testing your crisis management responses, wargaming your plans and strategies, rather than be left floundering come the day if you haven't done it. And frankly, the world we live in now demands nothing else. I would also say that the world we live in now demands an all for, for any company operating in a sensitive geopolitical re region of the world, and that means everywhere now, it means some form of intelligence capability. And I don't mean a rehash of last week's Economist put into a digest, which is too, all too often the product of a range of different companies. Actually, it's about tailoring your intelligence requirements to your business requirements in a focused way. And there are plenty now as a result of the experience of the Ukraine war. Plenty of ways of doing that, which sucks up social media traffic and, and together with sources on the ground to produce a tailored, focused product to allow you as decision makers in business to make the sort of decisions you need and to be forewarned against the crises and challenges that you will inevitably face. So building strategic resilience, building is all about understanding geopolitical risk, of course, but it's also more broad than that. It's about understanding risk in the round and avoiding thinking about risk in silos. Tim, thank you very much. Thank you, Sir Richard. And um, yes, I, I agree. Time for applause. <laughs> um, I think you've made a convincing case. There's never been more important to 
to assess and build resilience to, to risk. And I'm sure there isn't time for questions now, but I'm sure you'd be very happy to, to speak with anyone separately who would like to follow up on that. Um, moving on quickly to the next speaker. This is Robert Tomasz from the European Commission, who will update us on the status of EU critical raw materials policy. Thank you, Robert. Okay, thank you very much, Tim. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Robert Thomas. I work for the European Commission DG Grow Raw Materials Unit. And um, it is really my honor to be for the first time here in this uh, important event. So thank you very much for the invitation. And I will give you a short overview of the policy development in the critical raw materials domain. <clears throat> Europe is uh, probably the most ambitious continent uh, when it comes to the path towards the net zero future. We want to be the first climate neutral continent and <clears throat> with that, of course, there is a need, there is a need for the raw materials, you know, to feed the green technologies that are essential for this, for this target. We are very pleased that also the leaders of the Western Balkan join our Green Deal uh, strategy, that is the plan for achieving the Green Deal, the Green Transition, by signing the SOFIA Declaration in 2020. So, you know, we are partners in this, in this endeavor. And we also publish a very ambitious uh, targets from our industry to decarbonize that's called so-called the Fit for 55 package. And in our last industrial strategy from 2020 and the updated version one year later, we are combining the green and the digital transition together in order to also make the European industry competitive in the global, in the global scale. So I already mentioned that for these goals, we need raw materials and we need uh, critical raw materials, especially coming from the extraction, but also from recycling. Um, in the last two years, there have been several studies, respected studies that were modeling the demand for critical raw materials for greener technologies. And based on these studies, uh, it is clear that uh, there, is a, there is an increase of materials needed. So when it comes, for instance, to rare earths that are essential for permanent magnets, the very important part of the efficiency of motors or wind turbines, we are expecting six times more by 2030 and even 15 times more by 2050. The same applies to the, same applies to the battery raw materials like lithium, cobalt, nickel, copper, you know, all these materials will be, we, we will need more, much more. So, one aspect of this, why we are so dependent, is the fact that these materials we source from a very few countries. I think you know this, you know this map that is demonstrating where the Europe is uh, sourcing these materials. And you can see that, you know, we are clearly dependent on, on China, on South Africa for the PGMs. We are also dependent on, on, on other countries. So what are we doing about this? So in 2020, we came with the fourth list of critical raw materials. That is the result of the criticality assessment that the Commission, together with their experts, is uh, doing since 20. 11, so it's the first edition. So these are the 30 materials that are assessed mainly from the, let's say, supply risk perspective, as well as from the uh, economic importance. We also published for the first time the foresight study that uh, our colleagues from Joint Research Center modeled the, uh, they taken three uh, sectors and uh, nine technologies that are uh, uh, linked to those sectors and they model the demand for, for critical raw materials for those technologies there. And last but not least we came with the set of concrete actions that we are following since, since 2020. And these are the 10 actions that we believe that you know if we succeed with achieving them, oops, why it's 
we will um, we will increase the uh, the critical raw materials value chain in Europe and its resilience. So I'm not going to speak about each of the action. I will just pick up some of them that are important. I would say. So I would start with the establishment of the Industrial Alliance. So we set up the European Raw Materials Alliance, following a very good, very good example of battery alliance that managed in a very few, uh, in a very short period, to develop the battery industry in Europe to the, to the level that it is really very interesting globally for the foreign investors now. Uh, so we, all, we hope that ERMA, the European Raw Materials Alliance, will develop the same. We task them with two, basically two main activities. First is to run the thematic consultation on the concrete topics. So the first one was about the rare earth permanent magnetic motors. And the second to run the, um, the investment pipeline or investment platform. Regarding the thematic consultation, the first result about the rare earth permanent magnets was published last year. And there was a set of concrete recommendations and the way forward how to overcome the, the, the issue of uh, making the permanent magnets uh, value chain more res uh, resilient in Europe. Um, regarding the pipeline, uh, Currently, when we talk about the rare earths, for instance, ERMA has identified 14 concrete projects along the whole value chain. So not, not only extracting, but also refining and recycling of rare earths and permanent magnets. Um, these 14 projects in the total investment 1.7 billion euros, if they are all materialized, they can bring they can satisfy 20 up to 25% of the forecasted European demand for rare earths by 2030. So it would be really a big step forward to the resilience of this value chain. We also continue supporting research and innovation. This is uh, our flagship, so Horizon Europe. So in the first two calls, 2021-2022, these are the list of the topics that we put forward in the total, with the total funding over 300 million euros. We are supporting again the whole value chain, so the new methods in extraction, the uh, application of remote sensing in uh, raw materials or mining, also the substitution, recycling, etc., etc. The planning for 2023-2024, the programming is now being, being uh, finalized and we hope that the call will be, will be published at, by the end of this year. We are also working together with, our, with the Member States representative of, on identifying the viable or potentially viable critical raw materials projects. So on one hand we have ERMA pipeline with the projects, on the other hand, we, we work directly with the mining authorities people to give us the information about those projects in their countries. And also in this activity, we're promoting the uh, UNFC classification as a harmonization instrument to describe those projects. The last, last but not least is our activity in the strategic partnerships. This is for us very important, the raw materials diplomacy. So during the last two years, we've been very busy with trying to open the dialogues with resource-rich countries. So far, we, we have signed up two strategic partnerships, one with Canada, the second with Ukraine. And currently, we are working closely with other countries like Norway or Namibia to finalize the, the partnership. We have also started our dialogue with Serbia at the beginning of the year. So we hope that that dialogue will also continue. A strategic partnership is for us the way to diversify the, the, the sourcing of critical raw materials as well as to promote the, the way, the responsible way of mining that we do in Europe. So the, the, the environment, social and good governance practices. Speaking about responsible mining, together again with the member states, the expert group on raw material supply, 
and that represents also NGOs, the association in Europe. We have developed the uh, European principles for sustainable raw materials. So it's a set of eight principles that is covering the economic, environmental and social dimension. Um, we have, well, the main objective was basically to set up the base line, the, 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 the common understanding of the good practices in, in mining along the value chain. So from the extraction to refining to the post mining closure. And um, I think that we've been quite successful with this, with this document, that the principles are voluntary, but each principle is then linked to the, to the relevant European Aki requirement. So you have in the annex all the environmental requirements that are covering those principles. And we are encouraging, we've been encouraging the, the, the mining um, stakeholders to endorse these principles. So, apart from the action plan, we are also working on a detailed assessment of the strategic dependencies and capacities. So, we've already done two in-depth reviews. First, that was reflecting the COVID-19 pandemic um, disruptions. That was last year. And this year, in February, we, we published a second version that was focused on on uh, rare earth value chain and magnesium. Magnesium because of the disruption that occurred at the end of last year in China when China uh, closed some of the production of magnesium that caused a, a big trouble in the in the European in the European industry, you know, automotive and steel industry. We have been also encouraged very very clearly from the European Parliament that we should actually speed up our activities in this action plan. And last but not least, the head of states, a lot of European member states, um, clearly gave us the mandate to come up with concrete actions to, to lower our dependencies in critical raw materials. Okay, so, and our response to this political mandate is the fact that we have published the announcement of the, that we are working on the new Raw Materials Act, that, that um, it is a work in progress, so I cannot uh, disclose you know, the details at this moment because the scoping is still being debated, but of course the main focus is on, on strengthening the critical raw materials value chain in Europe, lowering our dependencies, so we are thinking about a concept like you know, defining a set of strategic projects for which we would, together with the member states, we would, we would um, promote the speeding of the permitting process, for instance, as we discussed in the first session. Or, and also we will try to mobilize the investment needed for those projects by encouraging the private investors as well as you know, combining or blending this with the public funds, so being the European funds as well as the national, national public funds. So we also want to the, uh, explore the option for the stockpiling uh, as a way of uh, mitigating the disruptions. You know, so we would like to again work with the member states to know how some of the member states are um, ma managing their strategic stocks in a critical related to raw materials. Of course, we will be promoting innovation and recycling in that in that legal proposal. So with that, I would like to thank you for your attention. And I would like to promote the European Raw Materials Week. That is an occasion that will happen in for, from 14 to 18 of November. And it's an occasion to, to meet with us and to discuss further, for instance, this uh, new Raw Materials Act. Thank you very much. Thank you, Robert. Very interesting, and um, I guess the obvious question, which we don't really have time for now, but is what contribution the Western Balkans countries can make to the critical raw material strategy. But I think we'll have to follow that up separately and offline. So, but thank you very much for your um, presentation. Um, we're moving on now to um, Dushka Rokavets, I hope I pronounce it correctly, who is the senior geologist with the Geological Survey of Slovenia. And uh, she will talk to us about the West Balkan Mineral Register. Thank you very much, Dushka. Thank you. 
very much for the work. So it is my uh, pleasure actually to uh, be again in Tirana amongst my Albanian uh, colleagues. And also I would like to share uh, some experience uh, with um, our recent work within the framework of the project called Reserve, uh, constructing a huge mineral register of West Balkan. So uh, the project, Project Reserve, was financed by European Institute of Innovation and Technology, that's KIC EIT Raw Materials. It was a three years project, uh, funded by around 2 million euro, and um, engaging 14 partners from 12 different countries, but the most important was the support and enthusiasm and the knowledge, of course, of the colleagues from uh, partner countries from Albania, Bosnia-Herzegovina, Croatia, Montenegro, North Macedonia and Serbia. Therefore, with their help, we actually succeed to build a very important work, which is now um, an outcome of the project, and that's uh, that's register of uh, mineral register of West Balkan. Here we can see the uh, consortium of this work. Uh, it was coordinated by Geological Survey of Slovenia, supported by uh, many industrial and education partners all around uh, Europe. But the most important was the common work and knowledge combined here with uh, this um, project uh, supported by the sites of mostly National Geological Survey from West Balkan region and also some universities. So what was the main point of the main aim of uh, our work? Uh, it was to connect the region, West Balkan region, to the common pan-European mineral intelligence network, which is actually EGDI system. It means European Geological Data Infrastructure, where all the mineral data put inside are inspired aligned. So uh, the way of uh, understanding this data is unique because everything is committed to the INSPIRE code system. <clears throat> the main objectives of the reserve project is, of course, the West Balkan Mineral Register, combining of primary and secondary raw materials mapping in six different West Balkan countries. But at least, but not uh, at last, not at least, also increasing capacity building within those countries. Capacity building, referring of mineral management on the national level, was important. Here we can see a screenshot of our website, where uh, the first uh, site is the reserve register, actually in shore sufficient flow of mineral information referring to uh, all different mineral deposits and their mineral endowment. Uh, and it is open now for European industry to expand potential business and uh, different investments in this region. And here we are at the West Balkan Mineral Register. The register is a huge structure. Let's say it, it consists actually of almost 500 different uh, primary mineral deposits of, I don't know why, but some troubles, and almost uh, 1,500 of mining and metallurgic waste sites. It does mean that 
all uh, that also uh, secondary raw materials, referring to the uh, mine sites, mine, wa mine waste sites, and metallurgic heaps are also put in this register. And with this work, I mean, the impact of this register is to make uh, to make West Balkan, that's something wrong with the system, I, I can't help, sorry, I apologize. So to make West Balkan uh, region uh, visible uh, to investor referring to their mineral endowment and to bring this region to the common European and also global mineral market. We made a spe special emphasis also to uh, to uh, critical raw materials, uh, for example, I then, there was I then, there was about uh, 110 different records and different deposits uh, identified within the region, referring, for example, to borates, phosphates, platinum, cobalt, lithium, uh, manganese, magnesites, and so. So, and all these data, so the, the work is extensive. It's not over the night work. It's uh, lots, lots of efforts and time consuming. Um, colleagues from uh, Geological Survey of Slovenia uh, actually goes to the field, to the uh, national, to the national uh, service and uh, made a lot of uh, conversation and a lot of uh, knowledge uh, changes, uh, experience changes, referring to the work. Uh, the work was dedicated to uh, not only to gathering, but evaluating uh, the mineral data, uh, which are now uh, Inspire aligned. Uh, that's it. Sorry. Um, okay. Uh, referring to secondary mineral uh, resources, I have mentioned they are part of they are part of this uh, huge structure of register. We have to know that uh, during the long mining tradition on the territory of West Balkan, uh, there were lots of polymetallic deposits, but only one or two. Uh, of metals were actually extracted those days. But uh, now, um, this, all these uh, huge volumes, uh, millions and millions of tons, now are uh, keeping on the mine tailings and metallurgic heaps. And therefore, they are uh, actually uh, became very interesting as a source of secondary raw materials including, including uh, critical raw materials. Here we can see uh, some, um, how, how many, uh, how many uh, mineral deposits referring to primary minerals we have identified, there were uh, identified during our work, referring to critical raw materials, 18 of them and even 22 additional deposits referring to different battery minerals. We have heard at previous lecture about batteries and all this stuff. So manganese, nickel, lithium, cobalt, and the others. <clears throat> There's a screenshot, very thin session of it, uh, presenting some of primary deposits uh, in Albania here, put into the uh, this common mineral register. And uh, I have to stress that all these data, mineral data, are um, described by several, several uh, <clears throat> different attributes. For example, um, primary mineral data have been described by 24 different attributes, um, <clears throat> taking into account basic data, technical and technological data, geological data, and also the others. And not only metals are put into, into this register, but also non-metals non and uh, some interesting deposits of uh, building stone, I mean natural stone for architecture. 
Uh, here we can see uh, okay, also um, attributes describing secondary raw materials from, from my, mine waste sites and uh, metallurgic heaps. They were described uh, by all these data, hum, hu, uh, huge number of data, referring, uh, some of them referring also to environmental, environmental information. Um, so, um, <clears throat> talking about critical raw materials and mining waste sites, there were identified uh, almost 1,500 uh, different locations spread all uh, uh, i mean uh, spread on the territory of around 7000 hectares so it's a, it's a huge mess that could be exploited and processed in the in the next um, period um, due to the new technologies we now uh, we now have on our disposal and to conclude uh, the presentation of our work, here we can see the screenshot of the European uh, EGDI uh, portal. I mean, uh, EGDI, a uh, huge mineral platform. Now, uh, all these data, mineral data, are designated also in, on West Balkan. So West Balkan is now part of the common European, uh, European um, mineral, mineral room, mineral space, and mineral sector is now uh, spread, I mean, part of the common European, common European uh, space, yes. And uh, yeah, as I mentioned uh, many times, I suppose, inspire uh, to, to obey or to follow inspired directive it was very important work within this project so all the data are put into the which are put into the register are inspire compliant and for the uh, kind of end of the presentation i would like to stress that geological survey of slovenia is uh, very interested for the cooperation also for the future and we are looking forward new uh, to uh, forward new um, uh, challenges on the of course within the topic of minerals and uh, mineral exploration and extraction so thank you very much one more time for all partners from west balkan that uh, that they have been um, engaged and very active uh, and supporting within this uh, project and huge um, huge work of this so thank you very much for your attention falemenderit Thank you very much, Dushka. That's very interesting and uh, looks like a fantastic resource. And of course, there's a very clear connection to the uh, critical raw material strategy, which uh, Peter discussed just, uh, Robert, sorry, Robert discussed just before. So um, we're moving on then. Uh, and the next speaker is uh, Mr. Adrian Biluku, from, who is the executive director of the Albanian National Agency on Natural Resources, who will talk about the sector in Albania. Um, Mr. Biluku, would you like to speak in Albanian or English? I will speak in English. If in English, great. Thank okay. You. Just to add, um, we would like to thank your organization so much as well for supporting us with putting on this conference. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Dear Chairman, distinguished uh, guests, dear participants, Welcome again in Albania, and uh, I hope that you will enjoy not only this conference and our availability, but of course uh, Albania too. I will start with a brief presentation regarding our resources in our country, a brief description about the uh, mining sector, and some recommendations for, uh, for you which are interested to, to know what we can offer. 
I want to also present a special uh, thanks to the organizer, to Minix Forum, which gives us the opportunity to know each other. And this will be only the first step, as I have with pleasure mentioned during the communications with uh, a lot of uh, the participants in this, uh, in this room. So we will offer the opportunity to start a new beginning, not only of communication, but especially of sharing. We will uh, present, we will offer, we will share with you our available data, our information, and uh, trying to communicate and to realize why not interested projects, not only for Albania, but especially for the Western Balkans. Sorry. A brief description about distribution of uh, our nature our natural resources in our country. As you can see from the from the slide, it's a schematic uh, presentation regarding metallic ores that we have uh, given the permits to the interested subjects. And of course, non-metallic ores. There are about uh, three mining permits, in, uh, especially in, in this case, we are presenting with uh, chromium, titanomagnetite, copper, uh, also iron, iron nickel, and of course about 300 uh, mining permits for non uh, for non metallic. A brief description regarding the chromium activity in our country, which has a long history. We have. Uh, been blessed from the chromium, and we have survived until 90s. It was one of the main uh, minerals that we have exported until 90s, with a lot of investment from the previous uh, government, which has been one of the most significant elements to receive uh, and to, to make the exchanges for. After 90s, we have used only the exploitation part of it. We haven't had the opportunity to do the research and exploration in the, uh, the research, especially at the same level. So this will be a clear opportunity to, to think about. There are available, from the reserves point of view, about 12 million tons of reserves from chromium. About 5 million tons of chromium are with a very good uh, percentage of uh, oxide of chromium. So 5 million are uh, with a very good percentage and the rest uh, are a little bit uh, less from the presence of oxide of chromium. But again, I want to repeat that starting from the chromium in uh, territory of the country, there are uh, good opportunities to go to to be focused for the new research and exploration opportunities. We have some of the main uh, places, main uh, cities or countries, which I want to say that the most significant are in, uh, in Bulchiza or in Kukos, for, uh, with, as I mentioned, with high percentage, and uh, again in the, in the southeast part of the country. Just for the distinguished guests and participants, in Albania we have this ophiolitic change, ophiolitic change, which come from the Dinarides, proceed in Albanides, Hellenides and Taurides. It's this magmatic complex which gives the opportunity to find not only metallic minerals, but of course non-metallic minerals. And it is this change, this ophiolitic uh, complex, which is separated in Albania in sub-chain part of East 
and the western one. The east part is more rich. And here we have all these uh, minerals that I am uh, listing and presenting, starting with chromium to proceed with uh, copper and to proceed especially in the southeast part of the country with uh, titanomagnetite, iron, nickel, and, uh, and so on. Sorry for, for my clicking, but it's, uh, it's an, also an emotion to participate in, uh, in mine, except, and of course, uh, not familiar with uh, Telecomanda. Just a, a schematic uh, design about chrome concentrate. After the 90s, it has been uh, a market research and a uh, kind of confirmation to enrich the chromium. And in Albania, we have uh, concentrate productions, thanks of uh, local and foreign uh, investors. There are about uh, 14 enrichment plants, which have uh, increased the concentrate production in the, in the country, especially, as you can see, in 2019 and in 2018, with uh, about... Uh, 66 and 63,000 of uh, tons of production per year. On the other hand, in the last two years, you can uh, clearly see the data of uh, COVID period, which is clearly a, a kind of uh, decreased and the problems that uh, we all know regarding the market requires. But starting from 2021 and now the situation is improving and we are optimistic for uh, for the future. A brief description about uh, ferrochrome production in the same way, conducted by uh, three plants with the uh, same similar uh, data, let's say, in, uh, in, uh, in a kind of uh, in a, in a kind of proper, proportional uh, value for uh, the years of 2018 and 2019 with almost uh, 68 and 66,000 and uh, with, uh, with a clear uh, record in the 2001 with the uh, highest uh, production for about uh, 103,700 tons. It's a clear data that uh, ferrochrome, which enrichment plans, it's a, it's a market uh, request, it's a market confirmation, and especially the local companies are working very good in this direction. We are optimistic for uh, 2022. The data are progressing in the same uh, line with the same rhythm as in uh, 2021. And uh, why not in our uh, next uh, meeting, you will have uh, the data updated for 2022. A brief description regarding the copper presence in uh, the country and uh, concentrate uh, production. Again, as I uh, mentioned before, part of uh, ophiolitic uh, change, part of uh, ultra-basic and in this case uh, hydrothermal uh, ores. There are uh, copper mining about, we have uh, two in, uh, in the area, in the county of Kuku, six in Mirdita, one in uh, Puka, six in uh, Fusharos, close to the Puka, and uh, one in, uh, in Korcha. Even in, uh, in Copper, we have had almost the same situation that we have uh, had with, uh, with uh, chromium, but in the last 30 years for copper, especially the research part, it's a little bit more advanced, especially from the foreign companies which has conducted the research projects in these uh, areas. Again, there are good opportunities for new research in this uh, sector also. A brief description of the numbers of the copper, copper production in Albania, as you can see with the main uh, places or uh, city, and with an opportunity of a uh, total to be discovered 
and uh, again to be uh, to be used for about 25 million tons of uh, geological reserves but again here it's a clear opportunity for new research and exploration a uh, brief description regarding iron nickel and nickel silicate uh, deposits mining uh, permits there are about uh, 31 with uh, with very good uh, opportunities not used in uh, until this moment in the in the right way that uh, industry is probably requiring even uh, today and uh, and in the future Albania offer uh, a great opportunity for uh, foreign investors, especially for iron, nickel and nickel silicate. We will give some uh, more uh, data about, uh, in this, uh, about this mineral in, uh, in this table when iron, nickel offers from the 92 to 2005, there are about more than 300 million tons of uh, reserves with a very good uh, percentage. There are about uh, six cities when uh, we have used these uh, minerals. But again, it will be a clear opportunity to uh, start exploitation in the right way for, uh, for these uh, minerals. I think this will be uh, a clear opportunity, not only for the, for the region, but of course with a good opportunity for the other countries. But here it will be a great opportunity when advanced uh, technologies, especially like uh, UK uh, technologies and expertise, it will be very appreciated to be present, especially with concrete uh, exploitation projects. Some uh, data regarding uh, royalty that uh, we have uh, collected until, uh, until today in our country with uh, some numbers to create uh, to you some, uh, some more uh, idea. It's uh, improving. There are uh, ongoing uh, guidelines, low uh, recommendations. And uh, we hope that uh, with some uh, changes, especially in, in this period, we will uh, adapt our strategy to collect more uh, royalty. Again, uh, here are some uh, data. These are in, uh, in LEC, which is uh, almost uh, the same as in the previous table. A brief description about uh, non-metallic minerals in the country. There are, uh, as I mentioned before, about 300 uh, companies, subjects which are uh, operating. Albania is a small country, but with a very diverse uh, geology. We have uh, Alps, like in Switzerland, we have uh, ophiolites like in uh, Greece and until uh, Turkey or uh, Iran. We have a great complex of uh, non-metallic which offer the best materials for construction industry. And uh, even for, uh, for the research point of view, not only to mention the fact that Interested investors will receive all available data that we have, starting from our agency, from our institution, Geological Service of Albania, Faculty of uh, Geology and Mining, Geoscience, and so on. But uh, in our uh, small uh, area place, we offer even geo monuments. So there are some. Uh, uh, elements, some data to be taken in consideration that even the construction minerals are very attractive in Albania. You have the list here starting with clay and schist with a great, uh, with a great use in cement uh, industry. We have today about four uh, cement plants which are operating in our uh, country. Two of them are uh, mostly international. We have basalts, which will be a great opportunity also for uh, future researches, 
very important for the development of the infrastructure, not only of the country, but also for the, for the region. Bituminous coal and uh, bituminum, which are uh, one of the best products exported from, uh, from our uh, subjects, which are uh, operating especially in the area of uh, Selenica, to proceed with uh, limestone uh, for the cement industry or decorative, to proceed with uh, all the types of categories for limestone, especially for the aggregate product production, and to proceed after with uh, gypsum, alabaster, conglomerates, quartz, lignite, sandstones, and the complex of non-metallic minerals in uh, ultra basic uh, structure with uh, troctolite, travertine, very, very, very nice to be used in construction industry, olivinite with a beautiful, uh, let's say, color and also the view, also some very nice building effusive rocks or gabbro that we use in uh, in, in construction industry and uh, not only. It's a schematic design regarding the, the distribution with uh, some idea for you regarding the main uh, non-metallic minerals and distribution by uh, subjects that we are uh, having in, uh, in our country. There are, as I mentioned before, local and also foreign companies, but we are open and we, we are waiting for the new investors offering very good opportunities, as I mentioned, for metallic and for non-metallic. Uh, non Again, uh, a brief description about the... Sorry, Mr. Tech. Biliko, maybe we could wrap up a little. Thank you. I, uh, I finished here. There are a lot of uh, other things and number uh, to to present to you, but uh, again, I want to to mention our availability, our uh, sharing uh, data, and I consider that mining it's a great opportunity for us, but it's only the beginning. So thank you all for your interest and we will be available to offer you everything you need. Thank you again. Thank you very much, Mr. Bilakuda. Whoop. Sorry. It's um, clearly, apart from the existing operations in chromium and, uh, and copper, there is a lot of potential for exploration and uh, a clear call to action for UK investors in iron and uh, nickel as well. So I'm sure there'll be many questions for Mr. Biluku, and I hope that he'll be around to, uh, to follow up with you afterwards. We're moving on now to the next speaker, who is Mr. Ivica Teleski, the president of the Macedonian Mining Association, who will talk about the future of mining in the Republic of North Macedonia. Thank you, Mr. Teleski. Yeah, thank you, sir, for the introduction. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Ivica Talevski president of the only association that unites and represents the interests of the mining industry in the North Macedonia. Uh, let me first express my satisfaction and gratitude to the organizer of this conference for the opportunity to address you and to take a part in this discussion. At the same time, I would like to thank the British Embassy in Skopje, the British government, as well as their trade representative for the Western Balkan, Mr. Martin Wicker, for their overall support for the development of this sector. Uh, next slide, slide number three. By the way, I come from the largest mining mine, the lead and sink mine, Sasa, where I am the Director for Sustainability and Deputy General Director. At the same time, I am the President of the Foundation for Sustainable Development of Sasa Mine. I am phases. This because, judging by my function, you can conclude why I choose to talk about the sustainability today and how important it is for the mining in my country. In North Macedonia, in the last few years, the dilemma of whether sustainable mining development is possible has climbed high on the social agenda, whereby different and even extremely op opposing opinions and views appear. Hence, I think that, uh, that we, as representative of this industry, should ha have oversee and defend our positions on this very important and popular topic. Uh, slide number five, please. 
Sustainable development includes three dimensions, as one of the previous, previous speakers already mentioned, economic, social, and environmental. Therefore, in order to give an objective assessment of whether Macedonian mining its commitment to sustainable development, we need to briefly assess its performance and commitment in the mentioned segments. First of all, I would like to briefly address the economic and social contributions of the Macedonian mining industry to the overall development of the country. If we take into account the key parameters according to which this contribution is evaluated, it is quite clear that the mining in the north in Macedonia has a positive contribution to the development of the country. But, number six, please. But first thing first, the mining sector in our country includes four types of activities, which include mining of metallic minerals, extraction of stones and other non-metallic raw materials, extraction of coal and lignite, and ancillary activities in mining. The number of active businesses entered in this activity in the last year has been growing, with the maximum number of active companies recorded in 2019 and was 2021. 221. However, it should be noted that most of these companies, or about 67%, are micro companies with one to nine employees. Only 2% of the active mining companies in the country, or total of four mines, are in the category of the medium, medium companies with up to 250 employees. And additional four more mines fall into the category of large mines with over 250 employees per mine. The largest Macedonian mines are metal mines, which at the same time have the largest share of about 70% of the turnover in this sector. Certainly have a dominant share in the production volume. The share of mining in the structure of the total industry production of the country has been continuously increasing in the past few years and reached 11.25-24% um, in December 2020. It should also be noted that mining is one of the few domestic industries with a foreign trade surplus of about 19 million per year US dollars. Exports in this sector traditionally exceed 200 million US dollars each year, of which over 76% account for ex export of metal ore. The share of mining to the country's total direct investment is also significant. In 2018, it was 11.4%. And in 2020, as much as 30.7% of the total direct investment in, in, which arrived in the country. The share of the mining industry in the total gross domestic production, GDP, of the country is around 2%, or about 180 million euros, which is relatively modest compared to the high developed industrial countries where the share of the mining in the total economy is much higher. However, in the North Macedonia, Mining is a victim of the trends of the total deindustrialization of the country in the past three or four decades, and its real development is far b below the potential of this branch and what is deserved. When I say the mining deserves more, I mean the impact it has on social development of the country, and because mining always, even in these difficult times, demonstrates social responsibilities. Here are some indicators that prove my point. Slide number eight, please. Mining in North Macedonia directly employs over 7,800 people, of which the four largest active mines in the country, Sasa, Buchim, Zletova, and Toranica, together employ up to 2,000 people. The average gross wage in our industry is continuously growing, and in the last five years, it has increased by nearly 40%. Exactly in the pandemic 2020, it was 33% higher than the average salaries in the country. For comparison, wages in the mining are 67.1% higher than wages in agriculture, 58% higher in the, uh, in the processing industry, 42.8% higher than those in construction, and 45.5% higher than wages in retail. Of course, the COVID-19 pandemic changed the overall living on the planet. In addition to the other consequences, it caused a global economical crisis that affected mining as well. So, like many other economical branches, it faced, it faced supply and demand disruption that increased uncertainty and created a series of difficulties for companies. 
the still unfinished pandemic was followed by the military conflict between the Russia and Ukraine, as well as imposed economic sanctions on Russia, which caused strong growth and large volatility of primary energy prices, increased volatility in financial markets, destabilization of global trade flows, and reduced confidence among the economical entities. However, mining companies, especially the largest one, which have greater opportunity and support from their owners and investors, have managed to withstand the challenges pursued by the health and economical crisis, adapt the new reality, and continue to implement their development plans. Even at on the onset of the pandemic, especially in the larger mines, additional investments were made, preventive measures and protocols were introduced, and work organization plans were adopted, which enabled to protect employees and reduce the risk of spreading the virus and at the same time continue working process. In this whole crisis, which is still going on, and the end of the which no one can predict with certainty, it's good that no major mining uh, facility in my country has stopped working, which clearly shows that the mining industry is generally more resistant, the, uh, more resistant to shock than some other sectors. The figures speak volumes. Namely, despite all the challenges, Macedonian mining in 2021 recorded an increasing in production volume of 2.4% and an increase in turnover of 33% compared to 2020. And this trend continues in the first quarter of this year. At the same time, aware of their importance for the overall life in the local community where they are located, in addition to the co uh, concession fees that pay, and which uh, finance important projects in the municipality, the mines, especially the largest one, continue to provide work for a large part of the population and a large number of the other local suppliers of various goods and services, those providing social stability for many families in, this, in, in these local communities. Also, these mining company, con companies continue to invest additional funds in socially responsible projects and activity in various areas that are important to the local communities, such as health, education, environment, sport, and support for the social vulnerable groups and people with disabilities. Slide number 10, please. For example, Sasa Mine, from where I'm coming, at the high of the pandemic, invests over 165,000 US dollars in various projects and measures that enable the local health system to better respond to the risk set by the pandemic. At the same time, investment continues in other areas with the annual amount of funds allocated by Sasa for the implementation of the projects important for the local community exceeding 400,000 US dollars per year. Speaking of SASA, I believe that it, it is a great example of the development of a mine that has put sustainability in the focus of its overall development strategy. It is essentially based on innovation and intensive investment in the modernization of the company in all segments important of the, its operation, starting from the new modern mining equipment and production technology in future improvement, the standards and working conditions, in improving the system of occupational safety and professional development and welfare of employees, as well as in environmental protect, uh, protection. In just four years, total investment in this area at SASA has ex exceeded 30 million US dollars. The effect of such investment are visible. Increased productivity and production volume, increased safety, introduction of an integrated system for environmental protection, and application of the most modern methods and techniques that provide strong environmental protection, increase of the salary and social stability of employees and their families, and increased support for the local community. But the investment didn't stop there. SASA has started the implementation of the new capital investment program worth over 25 million US dollars, which changed the method of excavation and disposal of the mine tilings. This program will enable more efficient excavation of the ore body, which will enable stable operation of SASA for at least the next 16 years, and at the same time meets increased safety and protection of the environment. It is also very important that the implementation of these new investments program brief benefits to all stakeholders. 
Thus, such an employee and their employing families gain greater security and stability in their workplaces. Opportunity for the new employments are open, mostly to young people from the local community. New business opportunities are open through cooperation with the local companies. Stable production of SASA is insured, which means stable revenue for the company, for the investor, for the business partner and local suppliers, for the state, and of course for the implementation of the projects are, that are important for the municipality and entire local community. These projects also protect and preserve natural resources such as water, where savings are over 60%. It clearly shows its value in terms of environmental protection and what benefit it will bring to the entire local community and the country at large. Slide number 11, please. After this, the key question arises. What can we learn from the example of SASA? Is sustainable development of entire Macedonian mining possible according to this successful model? Or more specifically, what challenges need to be overcome to enable sustainable development of Macedonian man mining and how to uh, unleash its potential? There is a consensus among those familiar with the, uh, with, with the mining in my country about the key challenging uh, challenges facing our industry. There are few, but in my opinion, the most important are leak of long-term strategy for mining development and generally low trust in the mining industry. Without going into the deep elaboration of these challenges, because it will require the, another conference only for that, on this occasion, uh, I will quote only a sentence from the final report, report of the Macedonian State Audit Office, which last year made a detailed scan of the effectiveness of the use of the mineral resources in my country, and among other things stated that, I quote, the leak of long-term strategy plan planning, frequent amendments to legal frame, the absence of bylaws and insufficient cooperation do not provide a solid basis for effective policy making in the mining sector. To illustrate how serious these challenges are, I will give two examples. The first refers to the law on mineral resources, which is Lex Generalis, a kind of constitution in the field of the mining in, in the country. Since its adoption in 2000. Uh, 12 until today, this law has undergone 12 amendments and supplements. The second refers to the sum by laws which are extremely important and which have a direct impact on the potential investment in the exploration and expo uh, exploitation of mineral resources and which are outdated, to say at least. Such is the case with rule book of the classification and categorization of stock of solid mineral resources and on keeping records of them, which dates back on uh, uh, 1979 and which still is in force. Sorry, Mr. Talaski, but we're running out of time. Could you try to wrap up? In Thank you. Of course, if such challenges are overcome, the potential for sustainable development of Macedonian mining should be sought in larger investment in geological researches, research, research and opening a new modern mines as well in the future modernization of, product, uh, of the uh, production. Thank you. Oh, you finished very quickly. Thank you very much. Um, thank you. <laughs> thank you very much for that. Um, update on SASA sustainability activities as well as the broader picture of mining in North Macedonia. And we move on to our last presentation of this session. This is uh, from uh, Dragan Milosevic, who is a board member of the Geological and Mining Association of Serbia, otherwise known as GRAS, who will talk about mining in Serbia, potential and threats. Thank you, Dragan. Dear ladies and gentlemen, uh, let me send a big thanks to organizer and to government of Albania for supporting this wonderful event. Um, I will shortly um, tell you a few words about Geological Association of Mining in Serbia and then some few words about um, geological potential and mining activities in Serbia as well. So GRAS is um, established in 2014 and it, it is the biggest and the uh, business association of mining companies in Serbia. Um, we have um, done a lot of activities related to implementation of new mining law since 2014 and um, we have, uh, let's say, 
uh, for the first time in the history of mining laws and mining uh, bylaws, um, implemented security of tenure in 2015. After that, we have updated that mining law altogether with the ministry two times more. So we have been supporting this wonderful event from the beginning. I was attending for the first Minex Forum uh, in Europe, in Vienna, since now. Um, what we, we have achieved with the new mining code in 2022, uh, our exploration time frame is eight years, uh, with additional two years for some uh, significant findings in, in last exploration years, and two years for retention of prepared documentation for approval for exploitation field permit. Um, again, security of tenure is the biggest thing and most important one, which provides security for investment for all uh, junior miners and big mining companies in, in Serbia. And we have um, a lot of uh, junior miners operating right now in Serbia. And we have um, shortened some permitting procedures uh, regarding mining uh, activities. Uh, GRASC has uh, adopted sustainable mining principles. I will not go in detail through all of them. You can find it on the GRASC website in this presentation later, which you will probably uh, download after the presentation. Uh, we have um, GRASC has uh, 27 members from uh, small mining companies, Serbia, for, from service providers to the biggest international companies like Rio Tinto, Alfarge and uh, similar. Um, uh, further, this is the sentence which I prefer mostly, and I'm sharing it very oftenly on the conferences, uh, where the critical focus should not be on how mining can be sustainable, but how mining minerals and metals can contribute to sustainable development. This is something which I which I like to share with all the participants. Right? On, on the conferences. So I think this is the light, latest uh, uh, thing related to, to uh, Geological Mining Association. And now a few words about uh, critical raw materials uh, uh, situation in Serbia, what we have there, what is going on, and what are potential uh, and threats regarding to development of those projects. So this is a base geological map, map of Republic of Serbia. Our geological uh, exploration was um, uh, very, very uh, high in previous and historic time. We have very high mining potential development for, for the mining industry. So on this map, which is done by BRGM, uh, previously there is 2,000 metallic mineral deposits and mineral accuracies around Serbia. 2,500 uh, non-metallic mineral deposits and occurrences, 46 coal basins, 250 oil and gas deposits, and four oil and shale basins. And you are probably aware that, maybe not, maybe yes, that in Serbia we have the oldest um, mining activities in, in the history from Neolithic time. This is Rudna Glava. Uh, location in eastern part, part of Serbia, where the uh, exploitation of copper has been found out dating 5,000 years BC. So what is going on currently in the mining industry? We have five active lead and zinc underground mines, um, one big bucker, uh, copper open pit and underground mines, mine one copper and gold underground mine, two big open pits, mines of coal, and more than 150 small small, small scale mining operations like um, sand pits, clay pits, uh, quarries, dimensional stone, etc. And uh, what will be the future of mining? It will be, it will be related to development of Yadar project, which is Rio Tinto, uh, Rio Tinto's project regarding exploitation of lithium and boron. Uh, Potechuka is um, a future gold mine, which will be developed by Dundee Precious Metals. 
And we have significant uh, findings of borates around Valjevo area, which is again very, very uh, interesting. And all those uh, minerals are uh, recognized as uh, critical raw materials by European Union, which we heard in previous presentation about. So this is the map. This is the old map. I, I can say it, it is some few years already old. Probably there is some newer and, and better, but I have this one. So uh, European Union recognized the critical uh, raw materials uh, around Europe. And regarding to Serbia, we have several locations. On this map is not marked uh, deposit of lithium, which is the other, uh, the other deposit near uh, Loznica. But what we have else is antimony, we have borates, uh, we have uh, some, some uh, magnesite and graphite deposits and uh, occurrences, some small uh, chromium occurrences around. So there is some potential for development and exploration of critical raw materials in Serbia. So, in the current exploration activities, we have around 100 active licenses for copper and gold, 26 licenses for exploration of lead and zinc, eight licenses uh, regarding lithium exploration, one is uh, regarding the iron ore uh, exploration, and two for antimony. And now the most important and most interesting part is threats or challenges regarding to development of mining projects in, in Serbia. Some of you are probably aware of uh, raising uh, NGO activities and uh, uh, protests against the, not only mining projects, but all, all development projects uh, around. So what are the internal threats? Um, I can, from my experience, recognize that some of the juniors running the projects in Serbia, they engage people with lack of experience in running big projects in mining, in exploration, in first line. What that means, they engage some local expert or some expert experts, but those experts doesn't have enough experience to run and handle exploration activities. And now uh, Vlada from Envico and ERM should pay me a lunch for this, but I'm, I'm pretty sure that some of the projects in Serbia are on the edge, on the edge to fail because of lack of uh, baseline study importance recognition. I'm following all the activities around Serbia, and I see that some of the companies are spending a lot of, lot of money for exploration, drilling, essay, everything related to finding something over there, but they don't follow up with baseline study, all those activities. And this is very, very tricky situation, because with the protest running around by NGOs, um, you don't have tools in your hands to prove that some of the potential environmental damages are not related to your activities. So the baseline study is the most important activity which should, by my opinion, start immediately with exploration activities. So even before any kind of drilling on the site, the best ad advice is to to do baseline study, at least some basic things related to water and uh, pollution. And again, we are witnesses of a lack of ESG and CSR management in junior mining companies which are running projects in Serbia. Not all the companies, but some of them are, does not recognize the importance of uh, ESG management. External threats. Um, we are witnesses again about false info sharing by some interest, interests group 
around mining projects. So you can learn from those people around, from NGOs, that every mining project will kill people, fishes, frogs, uh, all the plants around, that will destroy everything on the earth, that uh, we will all live in the dust and things like, like that. So, and with the presence of social media, this became very easy to share around. Uh, in Serbia, we have NIMBY wave, not in my backyard, which is very popular right, right now. All the, those NGOs and uh, protests are uh, put, uh, using this, um, uh, this NIMBY uh, approach. For, for Serbia, you can see it like, you know, March in Serbia or similar, which means like, you know, go out of, of Serbia. Uh, we have re resource nationalism, which is also present over there, which should be handled. NGO I mentioned over, already, and I must say it is it is very strong word, but it looked like this eco-fascism, eco which is which is very obvious right now in 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 Serbia, and that means that all those NGOs and Greens are against every kind of project. I can understand that they don't like mining projects because you can see big impact on the environment by mining activities. But again, they are against renewable energy. They are against wind farms. They are against um, solar panels. They are against the hydropower plants, they are against any kind of any, any developing uh, activities around. So there is no project which are supported by those kind of, of NGOs and, and Greens around. So this is something which is, as my opinion, not related to, to willingness to have a greener environment. But it looked like as a, as a uh, something which lead us all to some some pre-industrial time, some prehistoric times, to, to go to nature and to live without any kind of development and industry. So, with this, I will I will finish. Thank you very much for your attention, and uh, if you have any questions, thank you, Dragon. I'm afraid um, we're, we're just out of time and I'm sure people are looking forward to their lunch, but thank you for, uh, for your honesty around the threats and challenges. And actually, it seems to me it almost comes full circle to the first presentation from Sir Richard Sheriff on, on corporate risk. Um, I think you'll agree that was a very useful session on uh, overview of mineral resources uh, status in Western Balkans, particularly linked to the critical raw, critical raw materials strategy. Um, uh, it just remains to me then to thank all the presenters once again. I'm very sorry there hasn't really been time for proper interaction and questions, but I'm sure the presenters will be very happy to follow up with you in the, in the networking that follows. So thank you once again to all the presenters. Yeah.